Hello, and welcome to, uh, maths? Um, I suppose, firstly, I should start by saying this is very different from the usual content on my channel, and if you are one of my regular viewers, I apologise that this may not exactly be what you're subscribed for, but I'd like you to stick around still, and I hope that you find it interesting. For those of you who may perhaps be new to my channel and this is your first time watching, first of all, thank you. Secondly, I normally make gaming videos, some of which are highly edited and some are long-form let's plays. Um, but if you like this video, do not expect to find more content like it on my channel. Uh, I recommend going to 3 blue one brown number file or maybe even Yun Misali for more like this. Uh, regardless, if you do want to watch some of my other videos, fully appreciate it, go ahead. Uh, secondly, I'm going to cover some topics in this video that I'm not actually overly familiar with, uh, especially as we get towards the end. I'm not a professional mathematician, scientist, or even video essayist. I'm a mathematics student in university who's just finished their second year during the midst of a pandemic. I don't know what I'm doing, and I'm likely to make mistakes. Don't hold that against me, but feel free to politely correct me in the comics and maybe I'll make a follow-up video to address some things. Thirdly, maths has always been a big part of my life, and as I've gotten older I've only come to appreciate it more and more, but I've also met more people who are less interested in it. They think it's rudimentary or in many cases unnecessary to know, at least at the level we're taught at in schools. And my aim is just to try and change that a little bit, and show off a small fact within mathematics that displays just how connected maths can be in ways you may not expect. And hopefully this small beautiful fact will help you notice just how cool maths can be and explore further into the field. Fourthly, this script I wrote the first draft for a while ago, but I never got around to actually making the video. But with 3 blue 1 brown summer of mathematical exposition happening, I've been re-motivated to get this done for that. If you want to know more, I'll put a link in the description for more information. Fifthly, I'm British. I'm going to say maths. Deal with it. Now I think that's everything I want to cover for the preface, so let's get into the good stuff. A series in maths is the infinite sum of a sequence of numbers. Now you may be thinking, how exactly do you take an infinite sum? And in most cases, you can't, really? Uh, for example, if you had the sequence 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, and so on, you, you took its sum to get the series 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 and, and so on, uh, you would say that the series diverges, since as you add more, you are only going to get larger and larger numbers. Now, not all series do that. For example, 1 plus a half plus a quarter plus an eighth plus a sixteenth and so on equals 2? Kinda. We say it limits 2, because as you add more and more numbers, taking the partial sums, the value you have approaches 2. If you start at 1, then 1.5, then 1.75, and so on, and if you continue in this way, you'll never go past 2. Uh, you can look up Zeno's paradoxes for more on this. So now, what if we go back to our first series? 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 and so on. And change it just a little bit to 1 minus 1 plus 1 minus 1 plus 1 minus 1 and so on. Then what's this series limit? Well, if we try and work it out like we did with our halving series, we can consider the partial sums. So we start off with 1, then we minus 1, giving us 0, then we add 1 again, so we get back to 1, and as you can probably tell, that loops infinitely, always going back and forth between 1 and 0. Now we call this sequence 101010 a periodic sequence, and since that sequence never approaches one given number, it's still classified as divergent. So our alternating series, 1 minus 1 plus 1 minus 1 plus so on, is divergent. But that's not to say that it can't equal something. Unlike with our first series, 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 and so on, this one feels like it should have some answer. It must either be 1 or 0, we just can't tell which. And since it's not growing forever, surely there's some way to work this out? Well, in mathematics, there is something known as a geometric sequence. This is some sequence of the form a n equals a r to the n for n some natural number greater than or equal to 0. Um, so that halving series we had earlier, for example, is actually a geometric sequence. If we let a equal 1 and r equal a half, then we get our first number being 1, then next being half, then a quarter, then an eighth. So now, if we let a equal 1, and this time have r be equal to minus 1, we'll get our alternating sequence. Now, when looking at geometric sequences, there is a formula for finding the corresponding series, and more accurately, its actual value which is this, the sum of a times r to the n, from n equals 0 up to infinity, is equal to a over 1 minus r. Now if we apply this to our halving series, we find that 1 over 1 minus a half, which is 1 over a half, which is equal to 2. 
So maybe saying it wasn't equal to 2 earlier wasn't strictly wrong because of this? But what if we were to apply this formula to our alternating series? Well, we've got a equals 1 and r equals minus 1, so if we take 1 over 1 minus minus 1, we get 1 over 1 plus 1, which is 1 over 2, or a half. Now hang on, how can that be true? We knew it must have either been 1 or 0, but this has just come out and told us that it's equal to a half. Now I suppose that a half is the average of 1 and 0? So maybe it's not the most ridiculous answer, but we were so sure earlier that it had to be 1 or 0, and yet here we are. So what exactly is going on, and just how is this possible? As a small disclaimer, as I'm sure some of you are aware, the geometric series formula is only meant to be used when the modulus of r is actually strictly less than 1. And you may notice that the modulus of minus 1 is 1, which is not strictly less than 1. Uh, you may think that's such I'm like cheating by doing this, and we should disregard the half answer because of it. But as I'm about to go on to explain, there's actually a few view viewpoints in math which can give different results, and all can still be argued to be correct. Maths is built up from axioms, which we use to conduct maths, and if we change those axioms, we can just get different maths. Not strictly wrong maths. But don't tell your teachers I said that. They won't agree. Anyway, I'm going to move on from series for now, but keep all of this in mind. It will be relevant to what I talk about next, even if it may not initially seem like it at first. Now, I'm sure if you're anything like me, you've seen that word and probably just groaned. Statistics, to most people, at least when taught in class, is pretty dry and boring, but I hope that won't be the case here. In statistics, something you might not know is that there are two different statistical models. These are the frequentist and Bayesian approaches to statistics. The main differences between the two is that the frequentist approach, the one you're most likely used to, considers probability as a fixed property of the world we live in. So it is in this case that when in a given system, the probability of events cannot and do not change. If you have six red balls in a bag and four blue balls in the same bag, you have a 0.6 chance of getting the red ball from the bag. And unless you're removable permanently, changing the system, you will always have that fixed probability. In the Bayesian approach, however, this isn't the case. In Bayesian statistics, a probability of an event occurring can change to reflect our beliefs. Going back to the ball bag example, we don't know how many balls are in the bag, but might want to work out our chances of getting a red ball. What we can do is take samples and use those samples to work out our probability of getting a red ball. So if we take out a red ball in a sample, we'd want to increase this probability, and otherwise we'd want to decrease it. Yes, we could just take them all out and count them, but that's, that's not really the point here. Perhaps a better example to show how these two things are different is to consider flipping a coin, catching it in your hand, and then hiding the result. Now, what is the probability that that coin has landed on heads? Just think about that for a moment and consider everything that happened. You flipped a coin, it's landed some way up in your hand, and you can't see its result. But you want to know the chances that it's a head. Well, I'd be willing to bet that you probably thought it was about 50%, or slightly less, because it could be on the side, but I, you've caught it, that hasn't happened. And actually, you'd be somewhat correct in thinking that, but only in the Bayesian approach. It's weird that that's how our intuition works, when you probably understand and use the frequentist approach more, but I'll explain why this isn't correct in the frequentist approach. Uh, very simply put, the coin has already been flipped, and therefore the side it can land on can't change. This means in the frequentist approach that the probability the coin is heads is either 1 or 0. We just don't know which. Whereas in the Bayesian approach, because we don't know which it is, this means that the probability of being heads is still 1 half, even though it's already assumed its value. If you were to ask which side will it land on instead of which side has it landed on, then the answer would be the same in both cases, 1 half. Now here's where this gets interesting. At the start of this video, I talked about a series which could take on a value of either 1 or 0, but we looked at the series in just a slightly different way, we came to the conclusion it must take the value of 1 half. And now here we have some value, the probability of heads, which in one perspective is either 1 or 0, with no way to determine which, aside from looking at the coin. And yet, in another perspective, our probability has to be a half. It's interesting how these seemingly unrelated problems actually have this really bizarre connection. What does an alternating series have to do with flipping a coin? Well, like most conclusions in statistics, it's basically to do with how you present the information. If we'd asked a slightly simpler question of if, if we were to flip a coin, what would you expect to see? You'd expect to either get a heads, one, or a tails, zero. But our average or statistical expectation is somewhere between the two, like a heads or a tails. But effectively, it's one half. There may be a slightly better mathematical link between these, but I, I couldn't work it out. 
Uh, you could maybe play some game where you flip a coin X amount of times, and on a heads, increase your score by one, and then on a tails, decrease it by one. And then as X tends to infinity, for each heads, you should get a tails, meaning that the final score would be the answer to our alternating sequence. Or I could be entirely wrong and the link exists in some other situation. Feel free to go look into this yourself, by the way. I'd love to know where this link actually comes from if it's not just a coincidence, and it seems like there should be some more solid connection. Anyway, uh, last section now, and this is where we really start to get out of my depth. Okay, so this is where I start getting really out of my depth, and where I'm likely to oversimplify and make mistakes, so apologies in advance. But what is quantum mechanics? On a very basic level, it's studying the mechanics of quantum particles. This isn't helpful, however, so it's studying very, very small things, like subatomic particles and light, and how they move. Now, when things are this small, they act very differently to things that aren't that small. If you're watching this, you've possibly heard of Schrodinger's cat, and the idea that a particle can be in two states at once, such as light, which is considered to be both a particle and a wave, two things which have very different properties and act in very different ways. There was an experiment set up, called the double slit experiment, to see why light would interfere with itself when one beam passed through two slits, and you got a particular diffraction pattern. Now, I should probably quickly explain what diffraction is here, so in simple terms, when a wave passes through another wave, they interact with each other in such a way that's referred to as superposition. Now, if two peaks or troughs interact, the wave gets bigger in constructive superposition, and if a peak interacts with a trough, the wave gets smaller in destructive superposition. Now, diffraction is a phenomenon where a single wave gets interrupted by an object, and then starts interfering with itself, and depending on what that object is, the resulting wave can vary. So, to understand why this particular pattern occurred for the double slit, scientists observed the light as it passed through each of the slits. Which then stopped the diffraction pattern from appearing at all, and instead they only saw two beams of light, which came through the slits. This seems to suggest that the mere act of observing the light caused it to act differently, which at the time was, probably, a very strange idea to most physicists. The way quantum mechanics is now thought about following all this is acting as a wave of probability, which when observed, collapses down into one particular value. So with the double slit experiment, there was a certain probability that light could pass through one slit or the other, and this probability causes the light to act as a wave and diffract, causing it to interfere with itself. But when observed, this probability wave collapses, and it acts like a particle, only passing through a single slit. If that makes any sense. So what we have here is a certain object, which changes its properties depending on if you observe it, and in doing so, its probability collapses into one particular value. Now if that sounds at all familiar, it should. It's basically our unobserved coin, at least under the frequentist approach. The probability is ahead can be given multiple values, despite only actually taking one of them, and we can only find out which one it takes when we observe it, causing all the values to collapse into one. So what if we think about quantum mechanics with a more Bayesian approach? Well, that would be in our case when we don't observe the light, and rather than it having fixed values, it now acts with a probability of values, seemingly at random, presumably passing through a given slit half the time. This once again leaves us with two values the light can take, or we can change our perspective to get this value of one half, and I'm not sure about you, but I for one would be interested to know what the relation there is between quantum mechanics and alternating series, which causes this result to turn up. Because once again, I don't know what I'm doing. For anyone wanting to know the answer to these questions, I can't tell you. Like I said, I'm just a math student at university, and I don't really know what I'm doing. I'm sure the answers exist out there, and maybe this has inspired some people to go and look for them, or at least keep an eye out for similar relations. If I'm not going to give you the answers, you may be wondering what the point of this video is? And honestly, I'm making it because I wanted to. I came up with these connections while revising for an exam, and I thought it would be a good project to work on. Despite the other things I still need to do. Uh, <laughs> I'm also aware that a lot of people don't like maths. And I believe that for the most part, they that's because they find it difficult to understand, or they don't understand its applications properly. Um, I hope those of you that have gotten this far now see how pretty simple mathematics has connections in completely unexpected ways to much more complex fields, and perhaps have developed a slightly better appreciation for maths. And perhaps now you look at it in a way you haven't before. A big thing in maths is pattern recognition, and being able to identify where problems are and aren't linked, and I just so happen to think of these connections, and I'm sure I'm not the first one to do it, but if you keep your eye out and try to find more of these links, then 
maybe you could find just a few more of the unexpected connections of mathematics. As mentioned at the start, this is very different from my usual content, and I wouldn't expect anything like this again anytime soon. That being said, I hope those of you who have got this far have enjoyed this video. I've probably put a lot of work into it, but I can't say for certain since I'm writing the script first and I've not started doing anything else at the time of writing. But if you enjoyed it, please let me know in the comments and perhaps I can think about doing more of these in the future. Uh, I understand why you wouldn't subscribe given that I probably wouldn't get, make something like this again, but knowing people might come back to my channel makes it easier to make content. Uh, even if YouTube won't support my video, a subscription will still support me. I also do live streams on Twitch occasionally, again mostly gaming stuff, but if you ever want to talk to me about this video or other mathematical topics then I'd be happy to discuss it there. Or alternatively you can join my Discord where you can talk with myself and other members of this community, uh, as well as be notified for when I next make some content. Uh, apologies for the massive bug at the end, but if the video attracts a different audience then I'd, I'd like to keep them here. <laughs> anyway, uh, thank you all for watching, I hope you enjoyed maths, but for now, Tara.